from there that can learn about R Markdown. All right, just started recording. I'm going to share my screen. This one's going to be probably kind of more luxury, but I will send you links to my notes here. Um, so this is just from class that I taught last week, like um, just on Tuesday, December 1st. So um, if you want to follow along, the slides are here. I'm going to just post this link. In, oh, that's not it. In the Zoom. What? Actually, you know what? No, I will post it in GW Coders and just say events. Say notes. Uh oh, I can't type so that everyone can see it later if you miss it. Um, week 14 for my class. <laughs> So go to my my schedule and it's week 14 on reproducible reporting. And so you can look at the slides as a PDF or an HTML page. And then you can look at the notes that I, we have some exercises we do and you can look at them blank so you can try it yourself or you can look at the complete notes. So I'm gonna be showing the like completed notes so you can sort of see it because we don't have time to do all the exercises, but. Um, quick, quick question, since we're in a coding workshop, how'd you make that site? Oh, we're going to find out today. It's our markdown. Oh my God. <laughs> Amazing. What a, what a we, like, we great leading that. question. <laughs> yeah. You're a plant here. Yeah. This is an R markdown site. Everything you see on this site. Uh, this is my class. It's my syllabus, all my lessons, everything. It's all, all of it is R markdown. That's so um, meta. Yeah. And in fact, these slides are R markdown slides. Um, so if you go to the schedule and you say, click on that HTML, all, everything is hosted on on GitHub, even though the, the URL is uh, a GW URL, but it's just redirecting. Um, so these are all open source slides. So you can see the code that generated these slides um, yourself. So um, this is reproducible reporting. Uh, we had a quiz. <laughs> and I'm going to start by citing my sources, because um, I think about more than half of what I've learned is from this one amazing person. <laughs> Dr. Hill. Um, Allison um, is just, she's at our studio, but has um, lots of really amazing examples on, educational examples on how to use R Markdown uh, for a variety of outputs. So how to make slides using the sharing in library, which is what I use to make these, how to make websites, which is how I, what I use to make this. Um, so I always just say like, go view her stuff. In fact, today's slide deck is a as a reboot of hers, I sort of took it and modified it. Um, so go check out her stuff, follow her on, on Twitter. But I'll give you some quick overview of uh, what's this whole thing about and why we should do it. And I'm gonna start with the, um, the why question. And this is my favorite why question. And I think I have to share my audio through the computer sound so you can hear the, the dramatic background music here. So here, I'll watch the first minute or so of this. So that's my horror uh, trailer of, <laughs> of a non-reproducible workflow. I think many of us have lived in this before where we work across all of the separate Microsoft Office suites. And every time you, you do your analysis in Excel or R or something, and then you have to just copy paste things in. And it's a, like you spend more than half your time creating that report that you want to send and just formatting. And that, that streamlining that formatting process is kind of what our markdown is all about. So, here is the R markdown to the rescue. This is the one minute summary of what it is and then we'll go into the details. What is R markdown? 
In authoring framework for data science, you can use an R Markdown file to connect to data and run code, as well as to generate reports of your work. An R Markdown file is a simple plain text file with three types of content, code chunks to run, text to display, and metadata to guide the R Markdown build process. Open an R Markdown file in the RStudio IDE for a productive notebook interface. Write your code in R or use another language like Python or SQL. Call the render function to build a report from your file or simply click the knit button in the RStudio IDE. R Markdown exports your file into a familiar format, running your code and embedding the results in your finished document. You can customize how your code and text are displayed or you can create parameters to pass to your code to use at render time. R Markdown builds many familiar formats like HTML, PDF, and Word documents, slideshows, dashboards, HTML-based notebooks, books, websites, interactive apps, custom templates, and many more. In every case, your R Markdown file remains as a reproducible record of your work, easy to track in a version control system like Git, and easy to deploy again in the future. So that's it. In one minute, we're done. <laughs> um, so it's really just a plain text file, uh, but then you can combine text, code, um, and stylized code with Markdown uh, to create all sorts of different types of reports. Uh, I think the broader category, though, is, is this idea of literate programming. So Donald Knuth sort of, I think, is the one responsible for this idea, or at least first coined the term, that you should treat programs as literature, uh, stuff that's understandable to human beings. So we're the ones reading and writing this code um, and we should be able to just have text and code all together so that it's easier to read and understand what's what's going on and the practical version of that is usually just commenting you know putting comments in your code but that has a lot of limited there's a limited feature set where you can do with that so our markdown and really also the whole Jupyter ecosystem I think they both would try to achieve this similar goal of having a literate program where the code chunks are embedded with text around it. Um, so that's, that's our markdown. And I wanna, I'm gonna talk about each of these three main pieces of it, the metadata, which is controlling the output, text, so all of your markdown text stuff, and then code chunks is where we'll spend most of the time. Um, Allison Horst makes these wonderful little pictures and images of uh, R packages. So this is one of my all time favorites for complete wizardry of R markdown. You just have all this seemingly random stuff and somehow Markdown just converts it all into these beautiful outputs um, where you can have code, LaTeX code, Markdown, I mean, just all kinds of things. And, and it really is a combination of the Knitter library and Pandoc, which I'm not really gonna talk about, but that's, that's how the wizardry happens. Knitter um, is responsible for doing the conversion of R code to Markdown and then Pandoc converts Markdown to all sorts of outputs. So that's what's going on under the hood. And the, the analogy to what an R Markdown file is, uh, the analogy I use is um, a postcard, right? So you think about what's on, what's on a postcard, you have a bunch of different types of information. Um, and it's not, the information is not for the same audience, right? So some of it is for like the post office to know where this thing needs to go and what to do with it. And the other parts of it are for the reader, the end user to learn about some information, right? Um, so we're going to talk about metadata, which is really like this address stuff. Where does the postcard go and um, what do we do with it? So the metadata is, is controlled by the YAML, which is at the top of your markdown file. YAML is, stands for YAML 8 mark, markup language. So this is not part of your markup language. You're not going to see this in the document. It's just the instructions. It's like the conductor saying this is uh, what you need to do with, with all the stuff I'm going to hand you. Um, and there's a bunch of different output options that the general default, at least three that you usually want are a title and author and some what type of output the, the default is an HTML document. So it's just going to create a web page that you can render in any browser. Uh, but you can have a lot of uh, smaller little adjustments and features to, to, to tweak the look and feel of that output and all the different output options have have you know, multiple options. So this is how you're, they're entered. They're not entered as functions. They're entered as like indented. It almost looks like Python code, right? You put a little colon and then indent. That's how I, I think about these. So these are table of contents and I want the table of contents to float. And this is the overall theme of the, the thing, the, the way it's gonna, the look and feel of it. 
So here is a screenshot of an example. If you downloaded my notes, the blank one, you would see this when you opened it. And it's demo.rmd. So there's my YAML at the top here. This is my metadata. Everything between these three little hashes. Um, here's my title. Um, output is going to be, this is going to create a web page. And here's those little options that I've, I've set. Um, and here's a video of me running it. Um, so I've got it. I click the one button, knit. And it's going to take this document, process it, and create a web page. So there's the rendered version. I could open it in a browser and you see the, the output doc. So that's my table of contents over there in that float option. That's what made that, con that table of contents sort of interactive. It, it's, it's floating. So you see this as your result. You go from you know, this plain text code to a rendered HTML page. Notice that it was just saved locally as demo.html, but then I could upload this to any website and it would be live. Um, so this just has a few things like some text and a plot just as a demo, but the font and the color that you see here, that's all being controlled by that theme argument. So that one theme is going to change a lot of the look and feel. It does most of the heavy lifting for you. And then this is my table of contents here and, and float means when you hover over it, it drops down. If you want to look at all the other types of themes, um, these are the built in one. There's a lot of other options, but the boot swatch themes are, um, all of these are, are supported. Um, so you can just quickly look at how they, you know, what are the default colors and fonts um, to you know, find one that you like. There's, um, this is Flatly. So that's the one I rendered in uh, here. Looks like that. So anyway, lots and lots of different uh, options so you can customize the way things look. Um, and now you're starting to see my course website, you know, it looks this particular way. Well, this is a simple R Markdown page and it is a different theme to get this blue color. Oops. Um, okay, so this was my quick check-in for class. Um, the default options are this, it's not a function, so you're not gonna add parentheses. And, and you don't give arguments like, like this. So a lot of things in R are really functional, so your tendency is to use the arguments like this, but that's not how it's gonna work. It's gonna work a lot more kind of like a, looks like Python code kind of. Um, there's a ton of output formats. So that's just the HTML doc as a demonstration. Uh, you can go to this link and, and view loads and loads of other types of outputs. I mean, it's, it's pretty comprehensive what you can create. It's, it's almost ridiculous how many things you could turn a markdown file into and all the options with them. Um, I'll just cover a few to, to show that you can uh, render multiple outputs at once. So if you just, here's my HTML that I started with, but you can also add things like make it a Word doc, make it a PDF doc. And all of those, uh, these three are the built-in ones and you see them under this little knit arrow. So I'm actually gonna show you my, this is that same demo. If I run it right now, it will uh, just create this one HTML doc. Um, and it's a little slow right now. So there you go, we already saw this. Um, if I say I wanna make it also a PDF, so it, it added that in. So now it's gonna create a PDF um, and a HTML. Um, but by default, it only creates the first thing. So when you run it and you click knit, it's, it's just gonna create this first version. So here's the same information, but now as a PDF. So it's kind of like magical to go from one was a web page just a few seconds ago, and I changed two lines of code, and now it looks like a LaTeX document. Um, and nothing else changed, like none of the content changed at all. Um, and then I can also do Word, um, to Word, and so I've got all three of these as options now. Um, and this some like magically works too. The Word one is the most impressive to me because I, I generally have like just a terrible uh, experience with Word. Uh, it, it doesn't tend to play nicely with others, but here you go. Um, it, it worked. Uh, we got everything we just saw, but now in Word. Um, so if you want to render all of these, you have to use this render all, um, sorry, out, output format is all. So if you just click the knit button, it only run, renders the first thing, but you can say render this document and say output format is all, and you'll get all of these. So in my browser, wherever I had this, I'll have an HTML page, I'll have a PDF and a Word doc, all of the same thing. Some more quick check-ins, we'll, we'll blow through these. 
Um, so those are the built-in uh, formats. Those three, probably the most common you'll use. Uh, there's a lot of other extensions uh, out, uh, outside libraries that you can use to extend this to other types of formats. The three that I think are really, really useful are uh, Flex Dashboard for making interactive dashboards um, and Shiny Apps. Shiny Apps also kind of work in, in the same way, but this is where you can <clears throat> create a, an interactive board for people to click and, click and touch the graphs and then it, it interactively changes. Um, book down if you're making a, well, you can make a whole textbook. Probably the most famous one in the R community is R for, R for data science. Um, so this whole book is on the web and um, you can buy the book, hard copy, but the whole book was made um, with book down. So it says the book, this book was made with book down. Um, so you can read any of the chapters and it just feels a lot more like a, like a textbook. And then of course, this is an open source book, so you can view the source yourself and it's all a bunch of markdown files. Um, so that's book down and then sharing in is the slide format that I'm using to create these slides. This is um, kind of a, a tricky library to work with. Uh, everything you're seeing is a web page and it's, it's, everything is positioned using CSS. So if you're not familiar with CSS, sharing in can be pretty tricky for you, but um, that's, uh, that's the really popular slide uh, format. And then finally, Distill. Distill is another um, web, like HTML renderer. It's for creating um, a website, but I think the main feature that I think of it having is that it's, um, it's designed for blogging. So you can create new blog posts as just a, a new R markdown file. And um, it just looks a little different too. The theming is different. The, it's, it's really nice, tidy, clean, uh, clean looking site. Um, if you're gonna use an extension, you have to use the package name with this double colon symbol. So this is, a, this is the common formatting for working with an external package in R in general, is you use the package name with a double colon and then whatever function you wanna use. So in this case, it's distill package and then I'm gonna render this type of article and here I'm giving another option of a table of contents. Okay, so that's metadata output. Let's talk about text. Text is um, the other stuff, the message that you want to now convey. So we've done metadata, we're looking at text now. Um, it's just Markdown. So if you know Markdown, you're done <laughs> with this whole section. But I think uh, this is the page I always put in my book, Marks, Common Mark, for as a reference page um, for, you, for what plain text you input and what Markdown, rendered Markdown you get. I always forget some of these, especially things like links. And if you want to make a, a web link, do you put it in square brackets or, or um, parentheses? Like I always mix those up. So I go back to this page all the time to remember, wait, how do I make a link? And I just copy this and, um, and paste it. But images, links, block quotes, lists, all, all the main stuff you ever want to do in Markdown, here it is. So, so that's what we're doing in text. And if you have more time, I would do the tutorial. It's about 10 minutes. And it's a, it's a really helpful way to practice um, learning, you know, each of these little differences. So headers with hashes, you put another hash, you get a smaller header. Um, text, here's all the types of, uh, you know, bold italic fonting that you can get. So these are the main ones that I tell people to memorize, italic, bold, and bold italic. So you just add the number of asterisks you're going to give. Um, strike through, sometimes might need it, but much more you'll use a lot more as code text, the, the, the back tick for making code text um, to display, you know, if I'm teaching or something, this is the code I want you to use. It'll render as, as a different font. Um, bullets and numbers, you just put dashes or a single asterisk. Numbers, you put numbers. So it's, it's very simple to use. And these are the outputs that, that you get. Um, I already mentioned links, but you, you put the text in square brackets, the link to that that you want to go to in, in parentheses and you get something like this. So this goes to that web page to download R. Images work similarly, like you can, you just put nothing in the square brackets. So that I'm not showing you any text, so it's no text. You put a ex exclamation in front of it to, to let Markdown know, hey, I'm about to give you an image. And then this is the link to the image. So this is the image on my syllabus. Um, and you can also insert local images this way. If you have a local image on a local file, like this one is the hex sticker for my class. It works the same way. So that's text. Um, tables, uh, if, again, 
and I'm sticking within purely Markdown, but I think of like old, old timey tables. If you look at papers from like the sixties or, or earlier, they are like typewriter tables. So they didn't have a way of rendering a table. So they just use like pipe symbols to like create columns and rows and, and, and dashes to make columns and rows. So they, they did something like this. And that works fine. Like if you just use a typewriter, that's all you got, then this is a good way to make a table. So that's how Markdown text works. You use the same uh, type of formatting and it renders it into, uh, into a table. So that's a very simple, quick Markdown table. Um, there are a little more options you can work with. So you can use colons um, along that line to determine, do I want left, center, or right justified? So here's left, here's center, both colons and right justified. Um, and then of course you can insert any markdown formatting you want and it'll render it properly. So now we're supposed to take a break, <laughs> um, but we have to plow on. So that's output formats and text. Code chunks are the stuff that I think really makes our markdown so powerful. This is the, this is the piece um, where you can really do uh, impressive, impressive things with what you're rendering. So we've done text. Uh, metadata. This is this is going to be things like plots and and really nicely formatted tables. So our code uh, can come in two forms: inline code and code chunks. So inline code is um, a single backtick followed by the letter R, and then whatever code you want, and then a backtick to close it. So it looks kind of like this. I could have a sentence that says the sum of three and four is, and then anything in here is going to be R code. So it's going to take three plus four. It's going to compute that and whatever the result is, it's going to return that result that whatever's between these brackets. So it looks like this, the sum of three and four is seven. So this is really handy if you've got like a really a single variable that you want to display. Like, let's say you did some com computations and you computed the mean of something like the mean height of my sample. And I have a variable called mean height. And you could just say the mean height I found is and then back tick R and put the word mean height. And it'll substitute the object with the thing it's storing, which is like some number. Um, so I use this all the time to just display single numbers or single variables, things like that. It's pretty helpful. You can also use it to like dynamically create a, a link to a web page, all kinds of all kinds of stuff. So inline code uh, versus a chunk. A chunk is going to be uh, you know a more complex uh, operation of of code. Um, R has to be inside this little brackets to say that I want this to be rendered as R code. You can use other code types. Um, and so if I were to run this code, it would display this. Um, it's going to print out the code that I just put in to show me this is the code I ran and here's the result. If I run this in R, I get the same kind of thing. Like if I go to my R studio, um, this is just some data on bird attacks. I'm sorry, bear attacks. So <laughs> it just says bears, They're like, what is this thing? People in my class already know what this is. Um, so I'm just gonna load, this is loading it. And it's, so it's, um, it's attacks, uh, a bear attacks on, uh, sorry, bear attacks on people over the last hundred years or so. And it's just records of, of <laughs> random bear attacks. So you have information about like who was killed and like where they were killed and what type of bear and all kinds of stuff like that. So bears count, this just creates a, a, a summary count of um, each month, how many killings there were. So you get more people were killed in the summertime when they're out hiking, which makes sense. So that's, that's what gets shown inside the, the markdown document. If I were to do this though, where I say, I'm gonna create an object called monthly count, I get nothing. I just get the code back, but I don't get an output. Uh, and that's because I, I haven't asked R to show me the result. Likewise, if I did this in R Studio, I mean, it's the same thing. If I did this and I hit enter, it does, I don't see the table. This doesn't get printed out. I have to actually say, okay, now what is that thing? And then it prints it out. So this is what I have to do to, to compute it. If I wanted to create an object and show it, I have to do that. I have to name the object and then show the, show the output. There's a lot of different options that you can, um, used to tweak the way that this code is going to be rendered. Um, so this is a table of, of some common options. So I'm going to cover most of these. Um, and these go inside those R, um, that little curly brackets right after the R um, symbol. So by default, what I just showed you, it's going to show you the code and the output. Um, so 
cat hello world, this is going to print this text uh, to the console. So if I run this chunk, I get this. I get the code that was, was input and the output. You get both of those by default. So if you want to change it so that you only see the output, like you want to hide the code, I just want to show you the output, then you can say echo is false. So echo means, you know, show me the code that I just ran. So turn that off. The default is echo is true. So it'll, it'll only, you know, show me that output. If I want to do the inverse, like I only want to show you my code, but I don't actually want it to run. Maybe I'm teaching you something like this is how I built these slides. I want to show you this code, but I don't want it to actually do anything. I say eval equals false. So this is do not evaluate this chunk. Just show the, show the text. And then you can also run a chunk in the background by saying include is false. So this, it'll run this thing, but it won't show you any output and it won't show you the code. So this is really helpful at the beginning, like over here, I have this include equals false here because all I'm doing is loading some data and some libraries. And I don't want people to actually see all that stuff on my, my rendered document. I just want it to, I'm going to use this data later. So I'm going to say include this thing, actually run it, but don't show it to anyone. So it doesn't show you anything. Um, another really annoying one is messages and warnings. Like when you load a library, you get all this extra text uh, that no one ever reads that says, you know, information about the library you just loaded. Um, again, that's the kind of stuff that's useful for the coder, but maybe not for the audience. So I don't want people to see all that message. So I can say message is false and warning is false. So that when I load my library, tidyverse, it's only going to show me like maybe the code and no messages. Um, if I said echo equals false, it would show me nothing or include equals equals true, it would show me nothing. Um, and so this is like the quick overview um, of how you use these things. It's uh, they go in between the curly brackets, you know, any option that you're using and you can separate them with commas. Um, and, and just be careful though, like this first part, people often leave off the R. Um, if you just say, if you drop this part out and you just say message equals false, like it won't work. You have to tell R what language you're going to use. And so you can change R to something else to use a different language. So um, if you change it to Python, it'll just run Python in the background. So and like in Python, you can add strings like this by just doing them together, by, by adding them together and you get this rendered. Uh, this won't work in, in R. If I took this in R, you can't do this. You can't add strings in R. So it's like, oh, they have an error. But here I have a Python chunk. And so if I run that little chunk, it'll actually work. It'll, it'll render that thing together. I'll say, oh yeah, here you go. In Python, you can concatenate strings. So I've got a, a document here that has Python code here. And then later on, there's some R code to make this plot of a bear histogram. Um, and you can put it both in the, in the same document. Okay, and then finally, um, like a, a, a chunk to rule them all is your setup chunk. So right at the beginning, I'll have um, usually a, a setup chunk. And I always say include equals false because I don't want people to see this. I just want it to be run in the background. And I have all these different options. And so this is uh, like setting my warnings to false, setting my messages to false. So these are gonna control all chunks. So this is the chunk settings. Um, so any chunk I use after this, it's gonna by default go to these settings unless I overwrite it. So, so these are some common ones that I usually use. Comment equals this is uh, what's gonna display for a, any code I see. So uh, let's show you an output. It says these little, this little symbol, that's just, you know, showing the cursor of where I am in the console. So I'm, I'm controlling even that kind of detail about what I want to show people. So that's what this little comment thing is. And this has to do with the figures I'm going to show you in a, minute, a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's basics of chunks. And, um, and now I'm going to talk about using plots and some, a few more options for including figures, because this is one of the most common things we'll do with code chunks is create a plot. And maybe I don't want to show you all the, the code behind the plot. I just want to render the plot. Um, so here is some a combination of some tidyverse code with some ggplot code to create a, a bar chart. Um, and this code will print. So when I run this chunk, I get this output. Um, this is at the bottom of my demo file. So this is the same chunk here. Um, but just like before, if I assign this to an object, if I, if I did some assignment, then this is not going to print. Um, it's just going to create this object, but you have to actually print out the object for it to show up. So 
I have to do something like this, like make my object and then show it. And if I do that, then I get the plot. Um, uh, there's a couple options here uh, for you know, figure specific options to your chunks. So you can change the size of it without dot width from like zero to hundred percent. So here's 70%, here's 20%. So this is just gonna scale that document up and down, but it's gonna keep the dimensions the same. Uh, in contrast, you can actually change the dimensions with fig.width and fig.height. So here it's a six by four, here it's a three by four, so it's squished. So that's different from the out.width. And you can use all three of those to resize your figure to the way you want. These are in inches. So six by four is pretty, pretty common uh, around, you know, numbers between maybe three and eight get most good, uh, you know, high res images. Um, and then fig.path is where all those images are going to be stored on your computer because they're being generated. So they have to be placed somewhere. And if you don't give it a fig.path, it's just going to be thrown into some file on your, on your file system called like whatever the folder is like temp dot whatever, whatever. It's a really weird name. So I always give it a name. I say, I want you to put it in a folder called figs and it's going to create that folder. And then it's going to put all my images here. So here's that image that I just created. It's, it's going to store it as a PNG file. And furthermore, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to go through the work of saying, I want my images to go here, then I should probably give those images a name. That'll be helpful for me later to know what charts have I created. So you can give the chunk a name right before that first comma. So you, you give it the language you're working with, space, and then whatever you want to name the chunk. And it's going to take that name and, and use that name in the folder for that image. So I have this thing called bear month plot. If I go to my figs folder, I see something called, I should see something called bear month plot, although it looks like I haven't run it yet. Oh, I know why. Because I don't have it named here. See, I don't have the name in this chunk. So if I took this settings and I replaced that here, then when I run this, it will, uh, I'm just going to make it render to a HTML document real quick. Now it should create that image and put it in that folder with that name. So let's hope it works. It's always interesting to demo things in real time. So I've got that plot. It's been rendered and it should show up. Yeah. Bear month plot one. So there's my image that I created and it's already been saved as a PNG file. So this is really handy because I can, if I just want to like, create the plot. I don't actually have to go through the process of writing code to save it. Uh, by rendering it in a code chunk, I can give it a name, I can set the dimensions, I can set the resolution, all that information here. And I know where it is. It's in my figs folder. I can find it. I could tweet this out if I wanted to just show the image to someone separately from, you know, my whole report. So that's a really nice little way of, of changing your settings to help yourself out later to find where these things if you don't do this, you get something like this, you know, unnamed chunk one, unnamed chunk two. And uh, this is sort of bad practice. If you don't name your code chunks, you get this kind of thing and it's, it's hard to find them. Um, <clears throat> you can use a bunch of different formatting styles for good chunk labels, but I think of kebabs. So putting a dash as opposed to snake, snake casing, use kebab cases uh, for your for your files, so like unnamed chunk dash dash, and this this is sort of the default that R will uh, use. It'll it'll add ones, twos, threes with dashes. So I, I recommend this as my um, formatting style. There's a loads of other settings, so I'm not going to talk about them. But there's a million. You can just look up the knitter options chunks, and you can see all these different fine tune things you can do to to tweak your your chunks. Um, so two more chunks that I want to display or, or talk about um, images. So I showed you earlier how to use um, the markdown syntax for in, including an image. And most of the time this works great. It's really quick. And if the image is an appropriate size, then I think this is fine. But let's say the image is huge. Like you have a huge resolution picture that you want to put in, but you want to shrink, shrink it down. Then you have, you have a limited feature set you can work with in markdown. So I use um, a code chunk for this um, and use this, this function called include graphics, which is from the knitter library. So you have to say knitter colon colon and then include graphics. Um, and so this is the same path to that image, but now I can use all of those little settings that I played with earlier. So the same settings that I use to 
change the shape and dimensions of my um, my plots that I'm rendering, I can use that for outside images as well. So here, um, you know, I can say out dot width is 20% or 50%. And this is a local image that's in my folder, right? I have this thing called images and here's my hex sticker for my class. So it's a pretty big size object, but if I wanted to control the size then I would use this include graphics chunk. Um, it just gives you a lot more options than, than the plain markdown. Okay, and the only other one I wanna talk about is, is making a pretty looking table. So before I showed you how to use markdown tables with those little pipe symbols and, and that works fine. But let's say you've got a data frame that I wanna display and I've already computed the summary table. So here I'm showing the bear attacks by the type of bear, black, brown, or polar bear, and then whether it was captive or wild. And here's the counts. So this is, this is what I wanna show you, but this is what prints out to the console. So the information is there, but it's not really pretty. Um, and rather than like copy paste this and, and start putting the little pipe symbols in between each thing, which would be really annoying, all I have to do is tack on one more thing called cable and it converts that into a, a table. So this is your you know, data frame output. And I'm using the pipe symbols here. So if you're familiar with tidyverse, this makes sense. If you're not, just imagine um, the other way you could do this is, is say, um, create some object like table is this. So here's my table, it prints out like this. And I could say cable of that object, cable of table, and it'll, it'll render. Now the function doesn't work. It only, it only works inside a markdown um, document. So it's gonna convert this to this. Um, and there's lots of options here. Um, lots and lots of options with how you can make this look. Um, there's another library called cable extra. Um, cable extra is, I gotta find the GitHub site for it. Here you go. Um, just has incredible amounts of, of options for tweaking the way a table looks. Um, you can hover over it and create, you know, this kind of effect. You can make really pretty like static um, outputs for uh, like a LaTeX table. So these are something you might put in a PDF document. Um, you can make them interactive. If it's on a web page, you can do all sorts of things. Um, you can make them scrollable so you can show like the top five rows and then have a little arrow button so they can scroll through uh, colors, fonts, just you name it. If you go, go to town with your, <laughs> with your tables. And this is probably my favorite thing is you can include small little um, spark line plots inside a table. So you could have some numbers here and then show like a little tiny histogram of, of the distribution. So really clever uh, package here to extend the, you know, this kind of output into a really nice um, formatted output. So that was it for my class. I had a couple um, examples uh, that I wanted people to go through. And um, those were, you know, pulling in some new data and rendering, answering some questions about it. But I, the one other thing I'll show you that I had my class do was um, just how little it takes to go from sort of analysis to a really clean, beautiful, uh, report that I can send to someone. So this was a, the questions that I had for this last practice assignment was reading this data about college majors. And this was a summary, I'm sorry, it's a survey of recent college grads and it has information about their incomes and stuff like that. Um, and so the, the question I asked them were, was what are the highest earning engineering majors? Um, so I'll go, I'll go backwards here in time. So most of my students were able to do this pretty quickly. Um, they, loaded loaded the data loaded the libraries and then they made a little table that that has the outputs so here's i've sorted it i've filtered out i want engineering majors i've converted the, the casing actually even this they didn't have <laughs> all they did was say just show me the assorted incomes by major so here you go petroleum engineers make a lot of money and then you've got you know your different majors and here's your incomes going down this is the median income so that's enough for me, like the analyst, to take it and know the answer. And I could write below here, like, you know, petroleum engineers make, apparently make bank. That's what I wrote. Petroleum engineers make bank um, was my summary analysis, right? And let's say that's all I had. I'm just going to drop everything else, knit this together. And I get um, a document that looks okay. Um, 
you know, you can see the result and you can see my answer. And so this totally makes sense, but I wouldn't want to maybe publish it like this because I don't think it looks very clean. Um, and so it doesn't take very much to, to clean this up. Um, so what I, what I did to clean it up was I, I said, all right, let's, um, let's make that a, a title case for majors. So, you know, instead of those all caps, whoops, this is going to error there. You get something like this. These look a little nicer. And then let's turn it into a, um, well, first of all, let's just make it a, a table. So cable, if I just do that, that alone is going to convert this into a much nicer looking document. So I go from, that's one extra line of code to go from uh, this output to this instead. And so off, off, this is also not showing all of the data because it's just printing out the first few rows. If I use cable, I get this, you know, I get everything. I can show you the full data set um, in a much cleaner, you know, prettier table. So that's fine by itself. Um, and then I could go a step further. Instead of uh, doing cable, I could turn this into a, let's do another. Uh, here's my table and here is my, let's call this plot. I can tack on some ggplot code. So again, only a few more lines of code. I'm not covering, you know, how we make ggplot code, but five lines of code to make a really nice looking plot. And so that plot's gonna look like this, right? It's sorted. Um, and I, and this is something that is now like, I think very publishable quality. Like this is a type of chart that you could see in a, in a, a really top journal, um, to, to take instead of this long table to condense that information into a, a, a succinct plot. So it's very easy to see the scale and, and who's at the top and who's at the bottom. Um, and I could show this code or not, if I didn't want to show it, I could just say echo equals false. Um, and then re-render it and now we'll just be showing that the, the chart without the code that made the chart. So there you go. Maybe I want to do both. Here's the raw data and here's a, a succinct plot for, you know, showing you the results. Now the colors are a little different because this is a different theme. I used a, a theme called simplex. So I changed one little setting here and I got a different, uh, a different theme. So there you go. This is now something I might actually want to send to someone. This is a this is a single HTML document. So I could take this and email it to you. You could look at it in your browser, or I could publish it to a web and you could view it there. You could see my code. You could see the results. Um, so so that's kind of it. That's like everything <laughs> about uh, most of what you might need for our markdown in uh, I don't know less than an hour here. Um, I'll, I'll take the last five minutes here, maybe discuss it. Yeah, what's interesting is so just the other day I was on the New York Times website. I don't typically look at the Times, but um, they have those little trend lines that you are showing. And I was wondering, how are they doing it? They're doing, they're bringing it in with Java to the website because it's live data, but they're probably doing the same thing that you're doing there with the tables to make it easy for themselves with the mini trend lines next to the data. Yeah, um, spark lines was well, so the general concept of that. The the name of this is called spark lines, and it's a separate package called Sparkline um, to create these little sub graphics inside a table. Um, so these two things work together to to do that. It, again, it doesn't take a ton of of code to make them, um, but I think this is a very powerful way to display summary tables combining trend lines and things inside uh so you could imagine like i think maybe the most common one for for like COVID i've seen is like the states so it'll be like new york and then you'll see this little line showing the trend in COVID, and so you could you could compare all 50 states all at once in a single table um with a spark line cool i mean so there's a there's a school of thought on this uh, this whole concept. You know that I think I think the main thing that I like more than anything about it is that it's it's still just plain text. Um, so because I'm only working with plain text, it's super easy to show differences on GitHub, and to use Git to version control my documents. So I I can see the code in in the web. Like if I went to that uh, where was my R for DS. So here is a chapter from that book and I can read this and understand it. If I know how to read R markdown and code, then 
I can read this still. And if I want to make a slight tweak to it, like, oh, there was a typo here, I can just go in and edit the text and then it re-renders it into the web page. Um, and so this is like the reason I, I personally prefer this over things like Jupyter Notebooks because they're these more complicated objects that you have to open and render in a browser. And it's very hard for me to know what's, you know, what's been changing as I update it and, and push new, uh, new versions. Whereas here, I'm still just working in a plain text document. Um, the other thing I really like is this ability to do multiple languages like R and Python are only two, but you can put other ones in here. You can put in, I think it does SQL and some others, uh, at least current support for it. Um, so I can have, you know, some really complicated combinations of, of analyses. A lot of, maybe I'm working on a, on a, a team where I've got a, a whole group of people working in Python and they have some really complicated analysis that they did over there, like scraping a website and things. Uh, I could say, you know, go run that in Python and then bring the results into here and maybe use ggplot code to make a plot out of it. Um, so you can- so you're, you're saying that they would actually share the data objects in, in memory, Python and R? Um, so I could, because of this reticulate library, which I can show another time. Oh, reticulate, yeah. I, okay, <laughs> you can do that actually. <laughs> you very can, nice. You can have a Python data frame and then say, I'm gonna, a uh, pandas data frame, and I'm gonna bring it over here to R and now it can access it as a R data frame. Um, so, but you know, another way around that would be you do your analysis, you use in Python and then you write it to file somewhere, like write it to a CSV and then I can read that in on R code. So there's a way to get around that if you really That's true. wanted to keep those separate. Um, but you could also just write the code directly, right? So I could write Python code here and do some complicated analysis um, and, and, uh, and then use that object in R later in a different R, R, R chunk. So there is some pretty cool ways to combine them together now. And that's, again, something that I think is kind of unique to this environment where I think you can only, I think you can only run one at a time in Jupyter still, like you have to have that background kernel. I don't think you can mix yeah, I R think so. on. Yeah. So, um, so it has its features. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nifty little tool. Um, uh, for for combining a bunch of different things and, and merging them all together. All right, so that's it. Actually, I, I got to run because I have a stu appointment with a student who needs help with his R Markdown. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> you can timing. send it to this link. And say, this Here you go, learn everything. Demo. Yeah, I know I will, um, and I look forward to you know. Post, you're going to post the recording, I assume. Yeah, I'll post okay, it on YouTube. Okay, this is great stuff. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. This I I. I've been doing our markdown, but I learned a lot today. So <laughs> there's always more to learn. And again, follow follow um, <laughs> follow Allison Hill on 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 Twitter. <laughs> she oh, has yeah. like I'll, I'll every day that. she posts something new that I learn. I'm like, wow, that's so cool. I didn't know you could do that. Um, All right, I'll look her up there. And you're gonna be a YouTube star with those glasses, John. Oh yeah, these are these are very <laughs> cool. These are these are special because they they're glasses over glasses. That's why they're so huge. Uh -huh, even better. So it's even more meta. <laughs> okay.